Welcome to the Taroscope's tour. The very first thing which we would like to clarify is that both the tarot and the zodiac are not external phenomena. They are not out there and should be considered living essences or archetypes within each individual. You are a living, breathing zodiac. The magician Aleister Crowley and the mystic poet William Blake both recognized this fact and declared in similar ways that every man and woman is spiritually a star. Additionally, the great German philologist and philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche eloquently and enigmatically penned these words which aptly introduce and encapsulate the theme of the entire taroscopic approach. He said, as long as you still experience the stars as something above your head, you lack the eye of knowledge. And theosophist Madame Helena Petrovna Blavatsky put it this way, when the planets of the solar system are named or symbolized, it must not be supposed that the planetary bodies themselves are referred to, except as types on a purely physical plane of the septenary, and that means the sevenfold, nature of the psychic and spiritual worlds. Now a taroscopic chart, like any divination chart, is a record of the interaction between the conscious and unconscious dimensions of being, and between the masculine and feminine polarities of the self. However, due to modern society's aversion to whole brain intelligence, these esoteric disciplines once revered by kings are all but deleted from serious concern, being relegated to the level of novelty and pseudoscience. And though there are a plethora of New Age books rolling off the assembly lines, few authors or researchers concentrate on the relationship between the tarot and its sister disciplines, astrology, numerology, and Kabbalah. The new millennium is here, and it is finally time for the reunification of science and meta-science. The new millennium signals new paradigms in thinking and experience. And it is certainly time for a Tarot 2000, for an understanding of Tarot free from cliché, psychobabble, and dated jargon. It's time for each person to become their own priest or priestess and to dispense with religious and political authorities on the external level. We require revealers, not deceivers. Moreover, Gnostics, Theosophists, Alchemists, and Magicians know that we each have within us a living oracle. And we need to find out how that oracle comes into being, how it operates, and how to get directly into contact with it if we're going to be mentally and psychologically present in the new millennium and able to remedy the existential nihilism and decadence apparent everywhere. The time has come when the sacred arts are again presented and taught as one, for unless the four hermetic arts are themselves considered, learned, taught, and practiced as one, consciousness will not know unison. This is the message of the first card of the tarot, the magician. His esoteric letter is Baith, which actually means the house of God. And though this refers to the great pyramid at Giza, it also refers to the human body, our own temple, our own veritable house of God. As William Blake reminded us, all the gods reside in the human breast, that is, within. The magician's task is to unite the four into one. This is the secret message of the architecture of the Great Pyramid, of the magician's strange three-legged table, and of the grand hierophants and druids of Egypt, India, Ireland, and the world. Now, esoterically, the prestige of the cards is supreme. The tarot is immeasurably sacred and contains many magical secrets, even concerning mathematics and sacred geometry. Tarot relates to the Egyptian, Hebrew, Celtic, and English magical alphabets, to the Kabbalistic tree of life, the chakra system, to the alchemical process known as the magnum opus, to sacred numerology, that's Pythagorean and other kinds, to the physical orbit and movement of the luminaries and planets, to the phenomena known as the procession of the equinoxes, to the process of human individuation, to the yearly maturation of the human being, to the famous personality types, and to the zodiac, and to the sequence of the historical centuries, that's from the first century to the 21st, to the periodical table of elements, and to several other esoteric and exoteric phenomena. The tarot is the true book of life. There is no other. In fact, when students of alchemy 
are pontificating about the mysterious emerald tablets of Hermes, they fail to recognize that these are again the actual tarot. And each person is represented in the tarot's 78 mysterious and beautiful pages. We welcome you and invite you to take our Taroscopes tour to learn more about the enigmatic and powerful divination arts. Now, one fact needs to be thoroughly grasped and understood. It is a very special day when the divination arts choose to enter into your life to give you empowerment. A very special day. It is not and never is by chance that you are being drawn to these subjects. This very attraction, this very encounter, marks the difference between yourself and other people you know in the world. Whether you choose to follow on or not is your choice. But when you take up the study of these matters seriously, it is not you, as you presently understand yourself to be, that is in charge of the choosing at all. On the contrary, you are the one being chosen. It is because you are loved and cared for by something higher than your ego that this knowledge is made available. Your guides are doing their work to offer protection and wisdom at this time, in this age, and for their own good reasons. In this world today, for a very few people, the grace shines. It shines and leads the way to the place you need to be. And that place is selfhood. For did not the great Vedic masters state that self-realization is necessary before God-realization? And let us not forget what was written at the Delphic Oracle in Greece. Know thyself. Well, in order to know yourself, you have to look into the right kind of mirrors. The tarot and the divination arts are the right kind of mirrors. And in ordinary life, which has become extraordinary complex, we make mistakes, we take wrong turnings, which waste large amounts of time, energy, and money, and which cause great frustration. Just look at the complexes and vices which arise from human uncertainty and ignorance. We make a wrong move that causes ourselves and others enormous hardship. From these there arise the other pernicious quandaries which beset us. Guilt, self-recrimination, hostility, frustration, and regret, and so on. Or because we think we're right, we contravene the space and boundaries of another person who then becomes an enemy instead of a friend. Is this not the familiar pattern of life? And we are prevented from reaching our own goals and excellence when we make these kinds of detours. Since we constantly make decisions which are so important for our lives and for our responsibilities towards others, it becomes essential to get proper guidance. But that guidance comes from ourselves and not from others. Our words here are not meant to spur you to give yet more of your power away to others. They're meant to return you to psychic sovereignty, to the oracle within that has all your answers. Now, we already ask other people for a great deal of guidance in day-to-day -day affairs, and we constantly act on the feedback. So what is wrong with going to the source which always has the right answer? Asking someone who is like oneself, divorced from their source, for the answers to personal questions is obviously not going to ever foster wisdom. This source within us is the inner guide or oracle. And when we get into contact with it by way of the tarot and the divination arts, our lives change. This connection is known in the magical tradition as communion of the holy guardian angel. The Egyptians knew the higher self as the Ka, as the Karast, from which we get the Christ, or simply as the double. In alchemy, it is known as Agathodaimon, the holy serpent, and also as Mercury or Hermes, the psychopomp, the guide of the dead. The divination arts were in the world long before the high-priced psychologists and counselors, who are good at the patch-up, but not much involved in the prevention aspects. They are about healing, but healing is one of the most misused words today. It is not a state that one finds after recovery from illness. It is the state in which one never gets ill in the first place, or have we forgotten this? The Creator, or Universal Intelligence, did not plan for our lives to be full of waste and sorrow. We make it so, and we can change it. It is a great thing to be able to close that gap between error and truth even a little. It reduces the chance for karmic rectification, which is responsible for so much suffering throughout the earth. Karma is primarily ignorance, which causes all manner of human tribulation. As Socrates said, the greatest evil is ignorance and the greatest good, knowledge. Additionally, the magical arts aid us in the discovery that we are not merely the roles we assume. Beyond all other information and learning which is commonly sought, 
There is the greater human need to know exactly who and what we are, intimately and authentically. Also, we need certainty in daily life, and these are simply not found at the functional or utilitarian level of existence. The work we do for money and security is not the place to look. The physical sciences which explain the material universe are also not involved in answering these macro questions. So let's give up waiting for science and religion to explain the mysteries of being. You are the scientist, and your body is the laboratory. The universe is our great classroom. The planets, stars, and luminaries are the teachers. The universe is a supercomputer, accessed not with binary, but with the human intuition. The roles we play may not be the real us. In fact, it is because we have put so much faith in these falsities that multitudes of people are finding themselves in a state of emotional, psychological, and spiritual disempowerment. It accounts for the delinquency and disenchantment among the youth who have been miseducated from the time they were born. When we come into this world and begin learning from our parents and teachers, we're given the impression that there are no operating manuals for life, and they will each find out the rules of the game as we go along. However, nothing could be further from the truth. There are operating manuals, carefully disguised and hidden perhaps, but nevertheless at our disposal whenever we begin understanding the nature and application of the high arts of divination. They were created in times past to help us navigate through the tempests of life that we might arrive safely at our true destinations. Simply, we may think of life as a complex jigsaw. Usage of the divination arts or of the tarot help us to see the picture on the lid of the box, so to speak. Now, each of us must do the jigsaw to that we are committed. But there is great advantage if you have even the brief glimpse of the cover. Somehow, your hands move faster and you get it together with greater acumen. You not only inherit enough true wisdom to, and come to greater mastery yourself, but you possess a surplus to help others that come your way. This is how we truly serve ourselves and the rest of humanity. Now, isn't it time for you to have a glimpse of the lid of the box? Deep inside, we're all fascinated with the archetypal mysteries. You can no more abolish them than you can stop dreams coming at night. Everyone knows their own star sign, and we toss coins into water for luck, and we pick them up for luck. We love games like snakes and ladders, cards, roulette, chess, hopscotch, and we blow out candles at a birthday, and we make wishes, etc. These are vestiges of divination, still within the racial memory, as Madame Blavatsky, Manly Palmer Hall, Joseph Campbell, Marcia Eliad, and others have shown, it is all part of the overall disempowerment of Western man that we regard it all as superstition and novelty. Fortunately, with the advent of scientific paradigms such as quantum theory, chaos theory, and Gaia theory, there is a deepening understanding that our ancient predecessors had a relationship with and knowledge of both being and the cosmos more profound and intimate than we do today in our own narcissistic age of entertainment. Is it not strange that all the indigenous people of the earth today do not proclaim themselves to be anything like as advanced or as civilized as their forebearers who preceded them? How can this be the case? Do these testaments not go against all we've been taught about our origins and history? In short, the ancients were about living and not merely about lifestyle, about being rather than doing. They were less concerned with what to think than about how to think. They understood that the toxic mind can and will only perceive a toxic world. In fact, the toxic mind creates a toxic world. This is the reason why a shamanic tradition existed in the ancient world. The shaman, the wise one, was in charge of the tribe's health, physically, but also mentally, emotionally, and morally. The slaughter of the world's shaman and the neglect of their methods has brought us to the severely detrimental state that we find ourselves in today, psychologically and socially. Many persons develop a superficial interest in the tarot. It is one of those things which becomes fashionable at certain times. Now there are totem tarots, self-actualization tarots, feminist tarots, art expression tarots, fetish tarots, humor tarots, etc., etc. Some do not even present the complete deck, and worse, some have added cards. Both reduction and addition serves to abolish the numerical integrity of tarot. Diversity is fine except when it causes the true essence of a thing to be lost or obscured. 
To the purist, these creations are not real tarots at all and are misnamed. The tarot is something very specific. It is fine if someone wishes to display or relate their own personal vision, their quest or artistry by designing a deck of cards. But unless they are fully conversant with the numerical and geometric construction of this true book of life, their work does not qualify as tarot and should be advertised and sold under different names. One cannot make tarot subservient to their particular mindset and only pay fleeting regard to its own inherent principles. So let this be known. The true book of life has exactly 78 pages and is called the tarot. It is therefore to this book and not to the Bible that one must abstain from addition and subtraction. Such activity is against the order of things. Pick out the cards 7 and 8 from the tarot and you will see that they represent the sun and the moon. The number 78 therefore represents the coming together and nucleation of the sun and the moon, that is the luminaries within and without. Yes, the tarot represents the nucleation of all opposites and working with it we transcend duality. Confucius said that signs and symbols rule the world, not phrases and laws. He said this 500 years BC. He was right then and he would be right today. Symbols are extremely important for the development of mind and spirit. The beauty and superiority of the tarot lies in its use of symbols. The tarot's prime means of communication is through symbolism. The tarot may be described as a master chapter within the greater book of symbolism. And we need to be symbolically literate to listen to the tarot's profound wisdom and to decode what it reveals to us during a reading or during a meditation on the arcanum. Symbols have been used by all major cultures and naturally there could be no true advance to higher forms of language and communication without them. Symbols are higher forms of communication. Whether in the form of hieroglyphics or hierograms, as mandalas and yantras, as thankas or as sigils, etc., they can only be fully understood with the whole brain and not merely by the so-called left brain and its hyperlinear circuitry. Now scientists studying cognition and communication have discovered that there are at least 240,000 miles of neural threads in the human brain, enough to stretch from Earth to the Moon. On every micrometer of these threads there exist 250,000 units of information. But this data is, however, recorded only as pictograms, as composite images, and not as words. Words are of time, symbols are of eternity. When you look into your own mind and see your own thoughts, bathed in that strange and substantial mental light, it is images that you see in front of you and not words. The Christians were told that it was prohibited to make graven images of their God. This edict came even prior to the prohibition against killing. This is simply more propaganda. We also read that in the beginning was the Word. But this is now itself proven to be untrue. In the beginning was the symbol of God. This is how it was then and is even now. This is all that God can be to the mind of man. No word can encompass even the smallest part of the universal intelligence. Words define the creations and exploits of men, not of God. In order to know the latter, one must develop symbolic literacy. And studying the tarot is the most apposite manner of developing such capacities. It is also the mean by which we develop mental, emotional and moral hygiene so much lacking in this world at this time. The divination arts allow us to upgrade our intellects, our imaginations and our perception into a synergetic and polyphrenic mode where the reason and critical apparatus operate consistently at a high amplitude and in which the psyche is protected from the incoming viral messages damaging to its equilibrium and core nature. Through these arts we gain access to our inner spiritual guides who have all our answers, thus freeing us from chronic dependency on other people who are themselves likewise condemned to rely on the hit or miss advice of others around them. Working correctly and responsibly with these high arts serves us to liberate the higher will within us and makes it easier for us to detach from unhealthy fears and longings. Having our higher self as a friend and a counselor dramatically alters the ignorance versus knowledge and failure versus success dichotomies in our favor and allows us to perceive the compulsions that chain us to our slavery in our respective socially vetted roles. Eventually, 
we are not only able to release ourselves from our dysfunctional relationships with other people, but also from those inner, lower, emotional and mental drives that so frequently entrap us. Through these arts, we assume command over our own destinies and can escape the habituation and mediocrity which unfortunately has defined the lives of the great mass of urban humanity since the Industrial Revolution. We repeat, the zodiac is not only something out there in space. We assertively submit that each person is a living, breathing zodiac. Time in the external sense of the arbitrary movement of the planets can certainly be used for collective prediction, but it is more paraphernalia oriented than the archetypal method which the archetypal stellar taroscopic system of divination seeks to revive. And if we foolishly believe in an outer zodiac, and that distant rocks floating in space affect consciousness and destiny, then by definition we are also endorsing the concept of predetermination, which posits that we have no free choice. The Magi of old never taught such nonsense, despite what the so-called experts say, and the divination arts are not based on such fallacies. Their creators knew that man is far from just a passive actor in the theater of the universe operating in accordance to a pre-written and unchanging script. The soul is eternal. Its workings are on the deepest level beyond the realms of time, distance, space and speed, which are necessary categories for left brain cognition only. In fact, as the true Gnostics know, these four great interlocking modalities taught to every school child are the very elements created by the adversarial or Luciferian principle to capture the soul of man in the realms of illusion. Yet, strangely, astrology which in principle is meant to spiritually and existentially empower mankind, is entirely based on them. How can this have been overlooked? Several astrologers use the words archetypal, spiritual, or psychological in their works, and then go on to show that they have little idea about what these words really relate to. As the great German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, as long as you still experience the stars as something above your head, you lack the eye of knowledge. And we wholeheartedly concur with this statement. Our thesis is, in short, that once we understand this enigmatic statement, we can hearken in a new divination, a new astrology, which is archetypal and rectified and free from all the sundry paraphernalia. As Gnostics, we recognize three kinds of time. There is clock time, measured by a clock or a watch. There is seasonal time, measured by a calendar. And then there is psychological time, and this is measured by the zodiac. The first two are, of course, well known. In fact, we're veritable slaves to them. They're certainly not doubted. But the lost truth is that these first two originated from the third. This is why they all feature twelve divisions, twelve hours, twelve seasons, and twelve signs. To adhere exclusively to the first two and discard the third is sheer insanity and is responsible for the disorder and disempowerment so prevalent in the world today. Imagine living for a week or a month without your watch or calendar. Give it a try and see what happens. We will be in disarray. But magnify this to the soul level and see the predicament of the psyche afloat on the ocean of existence, lost in the labyrinth of matter without a thread. The universal intelligence did not plan things this way. It gave us the means to navigate correctly each and every sea and storm of life. It is we who have discarded our compasses, content to be directed by the lower ego. Caught in our mental webs, we do not even stop to ask if humans are truly made in the image of God, then, like God, humans should be totally without sex, gender, class, creed, rank, or division of any kind. Sadly, orthodox religion rests on the power of mere words. Moreover, what we have been receiving from the pulpits is not theology, but propaganda. Theology is something else entirely. The religious institutions have seen fit to create, promote, and reinforce these divisions, especially those of class and gender. Our parents turn us over to the schools in early life before we come to unique expression. After 18 years or more of conventional education, we operate only from the left hemisphere of consciousness and only from the smallest part of that. We are cut off from all that is sacred and deep. Most of us do indeed graduate, 
But do we know that this word really means gradual indoctrination? In light of this, we must ask, what if no religions existed in the world, no concepts or practices, no theories or paths, no one else to rely on? How would you and I come into direct contact with the universal intelligence? On a very basic level, readings operate like any psychological test. Scientists and behaviorists themselves use many psychological tests, like the TAT, that's the Thematic Apperception Test, and the Rorschach Inkblot Test, or the LAB, Language and Behavior, and the Myers-Briggs, etc. There are many others, accepted by academic intelligentsia. For instance, for years, researchers at Stanford University were trying to determine how many psychological types there are. Finally, they came up with 16. Well, curiously, the character cards in the tarot, that's the court royal cards, which represent the very same types, are 16 in number. And they had that centuries ago. Basically, the tarot works in the same manner as a common thermometer. When you go to the doctor, he pulls your records and pops the thermometer in your mouth. You give him the directions as to what you think the problem is, and hopefully the correct diagnosis will be made. It is somewhat the same when one comes for a reading. Your record is the personal chart, and the thermometer is the tarot. Only it takes the temperature of the inner psyche, the emotions, and the unconscious mind. There's absolutely nothing sinister about it at all, unless the practitioner is consciously deviant or malign. The Gnostics, the diviners of old, were the Earth's first behaviorists, or death psychologists, so to speak. Had they been given a true free voice, our world and our societies would be free today of many of the injustices and repellent characteristics. Those who created and used the tarot knew how to access the living oracle by way of the composite images and iconic symbolism. Confucius said that signs and symbols control the world, not phrases and laws, and he was absolutely right. Symbols are extremely important. When it comes to the structure and dynamics of the psyche, the tarot's rich canon long predates all of Freud's findings and those of Jung. This is hard to believe for many because tarot scholarship has generally failed to illustrate the true meaning of the cards as regards mankind's psychic dynamics. The development of the psyche and all its parts, id, ego, superego, the conscience, the concepts of regression, repression, sublimation, inflation, etc. are all there. Freud's terminology was all that was really new. But since everyone else who knew these mysteries had been persecuted and annihilated, it took until his times and under the guise of science for it to resurface, and even then it was resisted. It is well known that Carl Jung went on to use astrology, mandalas, alchemy, and even a little tarot research. There is not a single thing in all of Jung which is not in the tarot. The four types, the concepts of introvert and extrovert, the animus and the anima, the shadow and the wild man archetypes are all there. In this age of collective anomie and personal NY, we would do well to remember that the most pernicious diseases are not as is commonly thought of the body, but of the mind, of the psyche. The tarot is one of the most valid and important therapies to rid consciousness of its sickness. Its visuality has a profound effect on the mind. The tarot enables us to cleanse the emotional body and the deeper layers of the unconscious. When we're able to cleanse away the repressions, the hurts, the anger, the desire, and the false attachments that pester and encumber us, then we are able to receive what the higher guides are bestowing. We are able to apprehend reality as it is and finally avoid the pitfalls that beset the rest of the emotionally infirm and morally leprous masses of the world lost in the mire of depravity and narcissism. The return to sanity, both personally and socially, has been a major theme of innumerable psychologists, activists, and philosophers for decades. The men and women of reason have concluded that something is very wrong existentially with the post-industrial humanity. Experts have gone to great lengths to describe what is wrong with the way urban man lives. However, they offer precious little of substance when it comes to the coherent solutions to mankind's vexatious problems. We are now in the 21st century, and the time for problem think is, in the mind of this writer, over. It is now time for solution think, for mankind to proactively 
face reality in order to change it and to have zero tolerance for all the factors which enslave the self and the world. This paradigm shift involves the acceptance and confrontation of the dark sides of the human ego personality and a desire to see ourselves in totality for who we are morally and psychologically. It is avoidance and denial that have brought the world to the brink of ecocide and psychosis. The ego reigns, but the ego is nothing less than the ghost which has arisen from the grave of the self. The shift also means a return to the wisdom of our ancient forebearers who did things right the first time and who lived in harmony with the elements and with the flora and the fauna. The high arts of divination are their solemn and beauteous bequest to us and a gift that we need to respect and ardently employ in every aspect of our life. Within these arts we find the archetypal and numinous symbols of individuation which, like golden keys, serve to unlock the gates of wisdom to salvation. As the gates open towards freedom and empowerment, the vile door to the world's calamity and debauch is closed and locked forever. The divination arts contain the mystery of the great rites of passage and of how a man may make the crossing from the horizontal plane of his ego life to the vertical one of selfhood. They contain the secrets of how we transcend karmic existence and become one with our dharma, that is, our true life purpose. The cards of the tarot, like an astrology chart, help us demarcate the stages of the great rites of passage that occur throughout our lives. The average everyman may experience approximately seven major rites of passage during their lives. The awakened person can have more, while the symbolically literate and self-realized person may have considerably more. Their life may be one continuous rite of passage. Either way, the rites cannot be avoided. And philosophically speaking, they exist as unavoidable phases or stages of maturation of and for the ego. They can be attended by periods of intense euphoria and be considered peak experiences. However, they can also be times of enormous emotional and spiritual challenge when we are confronted by resistance of authority figures or strange inner compulsions that disturb our equipoise and confuse our domestic and social interactions. The obvious rites of passage have been recognized by mainstream psychologists and philosophers for some time now. They may include birth, entrance to school, puberty, leaving school, the first sexual experience, the first job, our marriages, giving birth, the loss of a parent, or some significant trauma, the astrological Saturn return, a divorce, menopause, retirement, and death. There are many others, such as the moments of betrayal for punishment for misdeeds, etc. Not to mention the various euphoric experiences of a creative, religious, or mystical nature. Each person's ego life has its own particular rhythm, movement, and duration. All of these are plotted in one's divination charts. The more unique a person's character, the more unique their individuation process will also be, and the more distinctive the rites of passage leading to them. The stage of individuation was known to the alchemists and described figuratively as the quartering or as quaternity. It is the squaring of the circle of the sacred geometrists, the fourfold vision of God to the Sophics, and the crucifixion on Golgotha or Skull Hill to Gnostic Christians and Druids. It was cryptically referenced by shamans, brahmins, vikings, and hopis, and every enlightened civilization on the earth who maintained a strict reverence to the rites and rituals associated with biological and psychological maturation. Those who have seen fit to ignore, marginalize, and annihilate the shamanic way, and who are responsible for the purveyance of false anti-human ideologies, have succeeded in bringing the planet to the brink of ecocide and mankind to the precipice of psychosis and oblivion. As a result of their subtle and overt coercion, millions of fear-ridden people like barren, crumbling debris orbiting a dead sun in the cold wastes of space circulate around and prostrate their dignity and sanity before the sterile religions which offer neither light nor warmth. For the mundane and pragmatic everyman, the various rites are experiences uncomfortable and even alarming deviations from the clear, sunny horizons which are the destinations of the amped-up ego drives. They are considered interruptions in the routine or punctures in the bubble of normality, which is anything but. 
due to these detours and times when the wires become crossed and frazzled, we can find ourselves doing some very strange things. The rules of the game evaporate or even appear grotesque during such traversals. And our experiences from the past, like the advice of others, become as useful as signposts in a ghost town. Today there is little time to care about anything that has no practical application or value. This pragmatic sense applies to questions of metaphysics and to the high arts of divination. Today, though we enjoy greater abundance and leisure time than most in the world, many of us exist in a state of existential disempowerment without even realizing it. If you work for another, you are, by your relative inferiority, fundamentally disempowered. This is a fact. And if you are not permitted to make decisions in a relationship setting, or practice the religion you choose, or play the music you desire, or dress your own way, or be with whom you wish, then again disempowerment exists. Then, should a challenge or major problem arise, there is the usual confusion, trauma, stress, and wastage of resources. As long as the ego is placed in charge of our destinies, our lives will continue to be mediocre and wasteful. Our lives are often little more than painful subservience to authority, followed by fleeting escapes into tawdry pleasures. In short, we seem to have forgotten how to take care of ourselves materially. Our precious energies get exhausted just taking care of our material welfare so that it becomes difficult to make other kinds of advancement. But surely the knowledge of how to manifest what is needed for the comforts of this physical self must be hidden within us all. Or are we really to continue believing what our parents and teachers have told us? Go to school, get good grades and be successful? How many of us can really testify to this being the best and most authentic kind of lifestyle? Do we end our inauthenticity and estrangement, or do we reinforce them by living under such conditioning? And what of those who do succeed along these lines? More often than not, they become the next generation of suppressors. Surely, the means of taking care of ourselves must be within us, regardless of whether we have made the world great or not. Would the universal intelligence place us into corporeal existence and then not allow us to make ends meet? Nothing of the sort. If we are in a state of disempowerment today, it is because we have fallen victim of human folly alone. One important way to attain power and success in any large enterprise is to hire good staff. We hire specialists, tutors, agents, human resource managers, and financial accountants, etc. With all of these working for us and given that they're all reliable, success is hastened and ensured. Now, what if we could hire 78 professionals experts, tutors, specialists, agents, promoters, accountants, human resource managers, etc., each with at least 10,000 years of experience, who work 24 hours a day without needing a break, and who remain fiercely loyal and always give the highest caliber of work output. And to top it all, they exact no wage, no salary for their contributions. With personnel like this, what would be the odds of our success? Well, there are already 78 professionals, so to speak, right at your command, inside your being, and at your very beck and call every time you lift a tarot deck off the table. What if one had a family of 78 members, each and every one working in complete unison towards a common goal? Would this not be a force to be reckoned with? Well, though it may sound rather strange to hear it, these archetypes of the tarot and of the zodiac are our original family members, not the parents that gave us physical birth. We need to get in contact with them as fast as possible. They are the ones that never let us down, and from whom we should never be estranged. Our inner living oracle is made up of 78 facets or archetypes which can give us the answers to life questions and bring clarity. The 78 archetypes are an alphabet of the universal intelligence. It is time to learn this language in order to open direct dialogue with the force that is always the giver. We are always bestowed more than we can ever earn, more than we can ever put out. The drudgery, disempowerment, inefficiency, and error that beset our lives was put there by ourselves, and it can be removed. You are working and existing for others and retarding your own life development because you refuse to put your own staff to work in the correct manner. Can you imagine the fate of any business that never had a care whether its staff, its personnel, turned up for work or kept to their job descriptions?
the world's written history has been tampered with by despotic, plutocratic forces who have kept humankind in servitude for millennia. As Rousseau aptly wrote, the falsification of history has done more to mislead humans than any single thing known to mankind. And let us also remember Voltaire, who said history is the lie commonly agreed upon. Luckily, we can turn to other disciplines to reconstruct the details that are needed. Through time, words change only slightly. Mostly, it is the vowels which interchange, whereas consonants remain very much the same for longer periods. And ancient written languages like Greek, Egyptian, and Hebrew, as well as magical languages, did not commonly use vowels. When history becomes distorted using synchronic and diachronic manipulation, language, words, and names often preserve much vital and fascinating information about the world of the past. So it is with the word tarot. The word tarot is primordial. During the earliest dynasties of Egypt, the supreme mother goddess was known as Tarut, and also as Taurt. As the cults and dynasties changed, she became known as Nuth and Mat and Ma and Maya, as Hathor, Isis, Serke, and Sophia, etc. Finally, in our era, she became known as Mara, or Mary the Madonna. But the original Madonna was called Taurt. This is where certain other names for women and deities come from. For instance, Ishtar, Tiamat, Ashtaroth, Astarte, Star, Tara, Thoth, the word Taurus, and the word tartan is a derivation as well as the derogatory slang word for women, tart. This arises because proponents of the solar cult demonized and rebuked all members of previous cults. A worshipper of tarut then becomes ridiculed and scourged as a tart in the same way that a worshipper of the lunar goddess becomes a lunatic, a monster or a sinner because sin was one of the earliest names of the moon goddess. Another word that was... Uh, used in the scriptures to defame the priestess was harlot. This word, however, comes from heredulite, which actually meant sacred woman or even beloved one. The Bible is full of mistranslations, most of them made purposely to conceal real meanings. The word tarot or taro was later pronounced with a soft H at the end, like taruth, thus giving us the familiar word truth. The word taro and the word truth are therefore the same. It follows that if one is seeking truth, to seek out the tarot. In Arabic, the root ta, T-A, means hidden or secret knowledge. In the Anglo-Saxon eras, the strong T sounds were softened to ch, so instead of t, it was ch. Tarut then becomes charuch, or church. A church is obviously a place of worship, where the great mysteries of being can be revealed. But the actual church is, however, not a building, but the tarot. The goddess named Serke, or Turk, or Kirk, is also a derivation. Her name denoted a circle, and that is exactly how the zodiac and the tarot were always formed and depicted, as a circle. Serke gives Kirk, which means church in Scottish, Gaelic. Even the word thought has its root in Thoth, which has its root in tarot. The word Thoth means a college, and the tarot is indeed just that, a college of the mysteries. The word taught comes from it, as does the word throat. The way that the word is pronounced in Celtic countries is always throat or tarot. The word Torah is a direct derivative of tarot. Torah has come down to mean the law or the way. When we do our theological homework, we find that it is an irrefutable fact that the Bible originated from the Torah. However, the secret truth is that the Torah originated from the Tarot, the original book of sacred law. This is one of the reasons why in the major arcana, card number two, the high priestess, holds a scroll with the word Torah on it. Those who think that this refers to the exoteric Torah betray themselves as novices in the metaphysical arts. The figure shown in this card is the very goddess that we have been discussing and her name is Tarot. She holds the scroll of her name. The scroll is the life that emanates from her womb, the very tapestry of life, multifarious and splendid. The loom is an archaic motif of the female goddess. We can also correctly see the scroll as the zodiac, on which is written the destiny, karma and purpose of the fool, or the archetypal traveler who is seen in the previous card and who represents the sun on its annual circuit. In medieval paintings of the Madonna, we will see much use of this unfurled scroll. 
In Hindi, the word Toran means gateway. And this is just the image that one sees on the card. Even the numeral for the number 2 in Roman has long been associated with a gateway. The high priestess represents the gateway to the mysteries of the microcosm and the macrocosm, which are encapsulated in the cards of the major arcana. Now the word ratio may also derive from tarot. Ratio means a measure, a relationship, a harmony, an order. Moreover, this goddess that we're talking about is herself pictured in the deck under cards 2, 3, 8, 11, 14, 17, and 21. It is interesting to note that many of the Renaissance decks mainly feature male characters in the major arcana. It is also a fact that the imagery of certain signs of the zodiac, like Aquarius and Sagittarius, that were originally feminine, were also later masculinized. The name Tarut was known as a goddess epithet far outside Egypt. In Celtic countries, like Ireland, we have the word commemorated in Tara, the high capital and seat of the kings. Moreover, Tara is situated in the fifth province of Ireland called Maeve, County Mead, again derived from the word Mat. The goddess Mat was connected to concepts of law and justice. Interestingly, the province of Maeve was the central administrative center where the kings or the chieftains held council. It is also suggestive that many famous tombs to the Gaelic queens are there. We still place the image of this goddess with the scales above modern court houses. The Egyptian hieroglyph for the goddess Mayat was also the symbol they used for the fraction one-half. This implies that Mat represented balance, symmetry, halfway points, and equality. Interestingly, the card of Mayat in the major arcana is called Justice. It's connected to the astrological sign of Libra, which lies in exactly the middle of the zodiac's round of twelve houses or signs. The word root of Mayat also gives us a plenitude of other words like mother and matrix and matter and mate and matrimony, marriage, middle, master, math, and measure and matriculation, etc. In Sanskrit, the word Tara means woman and also star. Curiously, the star card of the tarot deck depicts a female who is this very goddess, Taurt or Taro. The ancient writer Aesculapius wrote, The day is coming when the world will know nothing of the faith of the Egyptians. Our land will stand desolate. Tombs and the dead will be its only witnesses. Sadly, his words are very true. To this day, there are books rolling off the presses composed by would-be tarot scholars who doubt that the cards originate from Egypt. This denial is totally unbelievable since the very images on the cards refer to Egyptian iconography, symbolism, and cosmology. If you go to the text tour and read through the pages entitled The Egyptian Origins of the Tarot, you will see what I mean. On those pages are brief descriptions of the iconography of each card in the tarot's major arcana. Even a cursory symbolic analysis reveals the origin of the sacred tarot. After this video tour, spend a moment to peruse that page and put an end to the endless nonsensical debate over the origins of the cards. Now, the ultimate question, asked by believers and skeptics alike, has to do with how the cards or the zodiac actually enable prediction and how they give any kind of insight into the character, personality, vocation, and destiny of an individual. This question has not been dealt with appropriately by most writers. The answer should be known to those within the cognitive sciences, such as behaviorists and psychologists. But unfortunately, most of those who have expertise in these fields are not that much interested in occultism or divination. So, a simple discovery becomes again a mystery due to the divisional and exclusionary nature of human studies. In order for the tarot and astrology to work, they must have an intimate connection to human consciousness. In fact, we cannot understand the nature of the tarot or the zodiac without understanding something about the origin and evolution of consciousness. Now, we humans possess an inner sense of knowing, some have called this the intuition, some the still small voice, or guardian angel. Others call it the God force. Skeptics are more inclined to call it instinct, but nevertheless they cannot doubt that in certain important scenarios of life some kind of superordinate intelligence kicks in for our well-being and protection. Now, regardless of the epithets or terminology, 
this force does indeed exist. Then we have to find out how it came into existence, how it operates, and how we can get into direct communication with it. The entire taroscopic system rests on these three questions, or themes, which go directly to the heart of the connection between the divination arts and human consciousness. The proof concerning the connection between the tarot, the zodiac, and human consciousness is best explained through the means of numerical analogy. Numbers are the means by which we give expression to energies, those of a mundane or supermundane nature. This is why certain numbers were associated with so-called angels and so-called devils. Originally, consciousness was merely a primitive sensory response mechanism. The neocortex did not exist. The mammalian brain did not exist. And thought, as we know it, was non-existent. Consciousness, for want of a word, was at the rudimentary or primal stage. The cerebral spinal system was then a single fragile ganglion. It is from this rudimentary state that we have inherited our understanding of oneness. This state grew out of and recognized the zero, that is, the protein uroboric pleuromic state. Strangely, though no one can conceive or point to something that is actually a nothing, we do have the concept embedded within our minds. We do so because of the fact that consciousness arose from a state that it now, due to its own dialectical proclivities, can only conceive as a nothing. This nothingness was often symbolized in ancient times by the waters of the primordial abyss and by creatures such as the snake, the crocodile, the reptile or other demonic entities. We still use the term reptilian or mammalian to connote this primal cognitive stage of the brain. This single ganglion, the rudimentary ego, was oriented towards the inner world of the id, that is, the, towards the unconscious. We can imagine it, as the Egyptians did, as a single infinitely delicate petal upon a single lotus or papyrus stem rising out of the waters of oblivion. Now, from this stage of singularity, there arose a secondary apparatus. This was to furnish a center which could respond to external phenomena and to the external world of reality. With the advent of this ganglion, we have the primal bifurcation pictorialized and awed in all the cosmogenic myths and religions. It is the act of primal scission that the book of Genesis depicts, as well as any other myth that speaks of dividing waters or dividing luminaries. We read that the light separates from the darkness, and that the heavens separated from the earth, and the sun divides from the moon, and that male divides from female. And we have all through the world's mythology the recurrent motif of the twins. We read of the evil set and his good twin Osiris or Horus. We read of Cain and Abel, Christ and Satan, Adam and Eve, Enlil and Enki, Jacob and Esau, Arthur and Mordred, Sir Balan and Sir Balin, Tristram and Mark, Odin and Loki, etc., etc. We read in Celtic fairy legends of the light and dark sisters. It is a theme of art both high and not so high. From this bicamerality, we inherit the a priori category of Tunis. The entelechy continued through the centuries, and from the two, like a fleur-de-lis, there arose a third apparatus which had the job of administration, of processing and synthesizing the experiences and intelligences of the two antecedent ganglion. Thus arose the important concept of threeness, where consciousness rested for a time. It was relatively harmonious and stable. The titanic and threatening forces from within and without, which assaulted the vulnerable ego, were now kept somewhat at bay. This is why even today, threeness is considered an archetype of harmony and beauty. From members of the Christian religion, we hear of the Trinity, which is, despite its dressing, a commemoration of this stage of consciousness. Now, from the three, there came forth the four. This was the final steadying, organizing principle that was the necessary consummation of the previous stages. Consciousness is, today, still at the level of the fourfold. And this is why the cross and its various analogues is so cardinal and seminal a symbol, not only for Christians, but for the Celts and the Teutons, the Native American Indians, the Tibetans, the Maya, and other ancient peoples. All competent psychologists know of the four great hemispheres or modalities of modern consciousness. Carl Jung named them the intuitional self, the rational self, the emotional self, and the sensational self. So when we see the magician 
in the tarot with the symbols of the four suits on his table, we are looking at a disguised image of the union of consciousness, an act always associated with magic and the province of the master magi. The Christ on the cross or with his four evangelists, the Pharaoh on the fourfold cube, Osiris with his four sons, the Joker in the common deck dressed in his four colors, the Indians with their four directions, the dancing divas of India with their four arms, the dance of Shiva with his square cross legs, and the plethora of other quartering motifs, we understand that what is being expressed is the magnum opus, the uniting of four hemispheres of consciousness. This is the true meaning of dying on the cross. And those familiar with the imagery of the major arcana of the tarot will recall how often figures are shown with their legs crossed at the 90 degree angle, or how the square and triangle geometry is subtly incorporated into the designs. The tarot was designed to pictorialize the great journey, the ascent and development of human ego consciousness, briefly outlined here. Now, the Christed ones represent the next step in ego evolution, the so-called fifth element. This is why the number five is often associated with them, and for that matter, with God. The popes and bishops wear the pentagonal headdress. Jesus had five original disciples and broke the five loaves, etc. It is also the reason why in occultism the five-pointed pentagram is so revered. We see the magician standing in a pentacle or wearing it about his neck. Students of art may be familiar with the drawings coming out of the medieval and renaissance period, especially those by Agrippa, Vitruvius and Leonardo da Vinci, which depict the Adam Ka Admon, the Anthropos, standing in the shape of the five-pointed star. These depictions hearken to a future state of consciousness, the quintessence. The technocrats of today, as well as other more elusive personages, are also obsessed with this development and incorporate the five symbol into their creations. There are those who are of the opinion that this quintessential stage of consciousness is something that can be artificially induced or reached by human effort and by technology. And this is not merely a modern concept, but has been on the minds of the world controllers and their agents for many an age. Those who fund and control the sciences seem to have convinced themselves that by means of technology, carbon life forms can be advanced to that stage. These theorists, these founders of the technotronic age, see man as a machine. They dream of the organic computer and of the post-human world, where Cybermen, androids, robotoids, replace the problematic human being. They have chosen the sacred symbol of the pentagram to represent their cybernetic new world order. These hierarchs have spent billions on these various nefarious necromantic experiments. And many think tanks and technical corporations, such as Sun, Microsoft, Apple, NEC, MIT, CIT, SRI, NASA, the Hoover Institute, the Pentagon, Laurel, Genentech, and many others are well-financed fronts for this kind of research. However, one cannot artificially evolve. It is the universal intelligence which decides the development and fate of its creations. The human ego cannot of its own nature comprehend the repercussions of its incessant meddling. No amount of physical tinkering can induce the fifth stage. A great deal of science fiction has this great issue as its theme. But relative to our work on this site, we can emphasize that the tarot and the high arts of divination contain the secrets for the attainment of the fifth dimension of consciousness. They enable us to perceive nature directly and know reality as it is. They are the tools by which we cleanse the inner house of consciousness so that we might apprehend the inner and outer realities as they truly are. The toxic heart and mind can see only a distorted form of reality a reality as toxic and depraved as the mind which perceives it. The hygienic and realized man is depicted on the first card of the tarot. He is the true magician who understands that the pentagram represents the organic process toward self-realization and not the technological one. The bifurcation and subsequent organic development of human ego consciousness was a mystery known to the Magi in the earliest days in Egypt. 
If we look at the intriguing plates in the papyrus of Hunefer, also known as the scene of judgment, in the Egyptian Book of the Dead, we will see a cryptic depiction of this phylogenetic evolution from the first part to the fifth. This is a very sacred and enigmatic piece of artwork and has been deeply misunderstood. Its original name was not the Book of the Dead, but the Book of the Coming Forth by Day. This title connotes the rise from Euroboric unconscious existence into the light of consciousness. In front of the Pharaoh, arising out of the waters on which his cubic throne rests, we see a lotus or papyrus shoot. This shoot rises as one, then clearly bifurcates into two, and then further divides into three. And upon these three petals, we see the final four. Then to emphasize the connection to consciousness, the four sons of Horus, or Osiris, are shown standing upon the lotus. They are the final outgrowth of this plant of consciousness. These are four sons. They are the guardians of the directions, the cardinal points. They are not depicted as life-size for the simple reason that they were not meant to represent actual sons of a physical type. They are archetypes, representing the four psychic hemispheres within the being of every man and woman. This famous papyrus, then, shows, among other things, the very origin and nature of the psyche. These secrets were later rediscovered by psychologist and student of alchemy Carl Gustav Jung and are slightly more familiar to us in the Western world due to his fine work on ancient subjects. In short, the Pharaoh is the fifth element. He sits above the throne of four. He is the result of all that came before. The previous stages may also be described as the mineral, the vegetable, the animal, and the human. And the Pharaoh transcends them all. He is the risen one, the quintessence, the meta-human. This is the reason why he also has his arms crossed in front of him, because he is the quartered one or the crucified one. Death to the fore and resurrection was known and revered long before the advent of Christianity. The Pharaoh is also the child or son of Egypt. He is the agent of the goddess Mayat, who is often seen behind the throne. His throne is the cube because one of the meanings that the Egyptians wanted to attribute to it was the primordial mother. Salt crystals, which are cuboid, represented the earth mother. Moreover, the sum of the angles of a cube is 270, the exact number of days in pregnancy, or nine months. So the pharaoh represents the child Horus, rising out of and administrating for the goddess, that is, for nature. He attains the elusive fifth element because he and the universe are in perfect harmony. Interestingly, a cube, when opened up into its planes, makes a perfect Latin cross. Seen two-dimensionally, the cube describes a perfect hexagram or Star of David. So again we ask, is there any real difference in the image of Christ quartered upon Calvary or the Pharaoh quartered upon his cubic throne? Are we not dealing with one cosmogenic story regardless of the embellishments? The fact that any orthodox religion had or has any control or hold over the human mind is because it laid its foundations upon that which was anciently known and revered. We should now understand that consciousness has risen through four great stages. It did this sequentially, but with the antecedent levels are not forgotten. They remain intact today. There is consciousness on all levels at once. Each level is essential to the others. Thought is not essentially localized or linear. It is more synthetic and holographic. The mind is like the universe, a super fractal. If you go to the text tour and click on the page entitled The Book of the Dead, you will see some illustrations confirming what we are saying. Once consciousness arrived at the fourth level, it realized relative security, which it will never easily relinquish. It was so courageously won. There are certain properties that are implicit within foreness that make it especially valued. These properties were known by the ancients and are the basis for innumerable symbols, rites, and observances. The stage of four and the one previous, the three, are of great importance in understanding the tarot, astrology, and the other divination arts of magic. The architects of the Great Pyramid at Giza did not employ the triangle and square without very good reason. Their choice has never sufficiently been dealt with by modern scholars. We are told that it's just another unsolvable mystery of Egypt. 
Their temple design was based, however, on the origin and evolution of human consciousness. So that when one is within the pyramid, they're standing actually in a stone simulacra of their own mind. This is the reason why people have the experiences they do when they're there. And why certain other tombs that carry curses seem to have the power that they do. One cannot merely blunder into and emerge unscathed from precincts designed according to the geometry of organic entities. As the human body possesses its defense mechanisms, so do temples that are living portals between dimensions of being. The relationship of all these four ascending stages gives rise to other number harmonics, all of which aided the mind, the ego of man, to orient itself in the creation. It is its ability to do this that is commemorated in the mythologies of the various peoples in their myths and religions, rituals and customs. The ego immortalizes its own genesis and journey in this manner, and generations preserve it, forgetting what the myths and stories really depict and allude to. Often those we call great in music or in art or in architecture have their greatness coming from the fact that they are proficient in giving form and expression, consciously or unconsciously, to the movement through time of the ego. The ego is the hero, the champion of mythology, who slays the monsters of the deep and rises to greater heights. As we will see, the great art book in the world is the tarot, and it also depicts this act of becoming. The ego has not moved beyond the stable four as yet, because it has cognition of all the other quantities and numbers from four, and in the relation of four with the three, two, and one, and the zero. And from that relationship, it developed the power of addition and multiplication. This is why the symbols for these capacities are the cross, the cross of consciousness. Now, fourness, which is an innate category of the psyche, is also an all-pervasive number and proportion in the esoteric divination arts. If you go to the text tour, to the page entitled The Fourth Phase, you will see a list of examples of fourness and its prevalence in our world. In short, when we see the four appearing in architecture of the tarot, astrology, or Kabbalah, we know that there is a very good reason for it. But let us continue to see more numerical permutations of this tetrad. From four come all the other decimal numbers. If we add sequentially the digits that make four in the Pythagorean manner, we will understand why the Maya, for instance, declared that they only had four numbers because 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10. And 10 is the perfect number, and its symbols are the cross. This links with Egyptian mythology and with the Christian ethos, as both the Pharaoh and the Christ are seen quartered. This means that the postures that they are seen in and the mythologies surrounding them are precisely designed leitmotifs and fictions which elaborate the great theme that cannot be fully explicated in a linear manner. The name of the first god of the first dynasty of Egypt is Atum, A-T-U-M. In fact, this is where we get the word Adum or Adam from. They're both progenitors, and the latter certainly originates from the former. The Hindus also had this embodied in their Atma or Atman. The Greeks, like Zosimus of Panopolis, identified the letters of Adam with the four elements, or four directions. We also get the word Atom, A-T-O-M, from this, and the Semites have their Adon, or Adonai. These terms all refer to the first cause, and numerologically, the word Atum, A-T-U-M, is extremely interesting. Its letters, amazingly, are 1, 2, 3, 4, which is equaling 10. Now, Adam is numerologically 1414 in Western numerology, which also equals 10. In fact, the reason why Adam is 1414 is partly because of the human hands. Raised in front of one, they figure one thumb and four fingers. This is just the way that the ancients did things, which seems strange to us. Adam was the hands of God, the builder, the namer of the animals, etc. And this accounts for why the Egyptian pyramids were also always of four sides. They were living monuments to the genesis and ascent of consciousness. The most interesting fact is, though, that both these gods, 
Atum or Adonai or Ad Adam, represent the fourth level of human consciousness, which is sentient and objective and endowed with reason and imagination. The numerology of the names is a confirmation of the connection with consciousness. Many other gods and heroes have imagery of fourness. Many names of God are of four letters, no less than the most important name of all, the so-called Tetragrammaton, the yod He vau He. There is another interesting Egyptian connection. The word pyramid really derives from the Egyptian pyramid, which means division of ten or division of number or division of perfection. This is why it looks as if it is just that, a base of four and sides of three. The pharaoh's crossed arms are also an ideogram for the division of ten. This is because ten or a ten is man. He has literally arisen due to entelechy, a division from pleuromic unity as we have briefly explained. These early god images and the architecture of ancient monuments are encapsulations of the origin and evolution of consciousness. There are several other examples of this mathematical and geometrical premise, the division of ten. One is Moses coming out of the holy mountain in Egypt with the Ten Commandments. But those commandments are on two tablets, five commandments on each, hence division of ten. And the sacred mountain is, however, not Sinai, but the pyramid, the real holy mountain in Egypt. The word Moses did not mean from the waters, but meant one who has been baptized with water or who baptizes with water. Moses, or at least his prototype, was an initiator into the Hermetic Mysteries. And there are several stelae or cylinder seals from Babylon and Abyssinia, etc., that show the king, like a pharaoh, in an enclosed precinct, sitting on a cube throne, holding the ring and the rod, that is, the circle and the staff, these being the symbols of the union of the masculine and feminine polarities and modalities of gender and expression. There are also a sigil of the division of consciousness. But the ring and the rod, or the circle and the staff, are the sigils that we still use for the number ten. The goddess Lilith, in an early carving, is also seen with her arms symmetrically divided while each hand grasps the same ring and rod motif. In the Celtic Gaelic periods, we see the horned forest god Hearn also called Cernanos, sitting in a yogic asana, holding a long coiling serpent in the left hand and a circlet in the right hand. Today we are accustomed to seeing the magician or conjurer holding a wand and a ring, often shown with a top hat, pulling live animals and all sorts of paraphernalia from it. The hat is the ring, which is the ovum, the inexhaustible womb of the universe that teems with life. The modern computer language happens to operate using the same symbols, the ring and the rod. Now we come full circle to the original question of how the zodiac and tarot can be used as divination tools and whether they are really external to us. We've seen a brief interpretation of how the mind ascends through its four main divisions, which provided the basis for a symbiotic relationship with reality. We have an idea that this ascent is commemorated in all the great complex myths of every culture and epoch. However, the fact is that human consciousness found that foreness and all the prior stages were too limiting to completely account for and embrace the diversity of physical phenomena. And, without wishing to dispose of the fourth principle, it discovered the principles we know as addition and multiplication, which enabled it to combine the aspects of its own nature to expand its plastic organic template. From the three and the four, the seven and the twelve were born. In those days when man first centered himself as an authority in the universe, he looked to the night sky and found it to be analogous to his inner unconscious. Of both he was frightened, for they seemed spasmodic, chaotic, full of random happenings which threatened the autonomy of his fragile ego. It was on to the night sky that the mind of man first projected its noetic template of the three, the four, the seven, and the twelve. William Blake referred to this projection as the great chain. The projection of our inner architecture gave birth to the external zodiac with its twelve signs, seven planets, four elements, and three modalities. We have patterned the external on the internal world. We have bonded physical and psychic energy. 
We have turned our minds inside out, so to speak, in order to feel acclimatized and secure in the universe. The process continued until everything was circumscribed by psychic projections. Every infant partakes of this psychic activity from the moment it enters the world. And because it is all happening unconsciously, the conscious mind ends up thinking that the universe is inherently encoded with the categories that the mind has actually projected there. This is the reason why we today think of the zodiac and the planets as innately effective on consciousness and personality. But a greater mystery is here revealed. So, in summary, divination is legitimate and possible because both the zodiac and the tarot are founded upon the 3-4 or the 7 and the 12 proportion and ratio. The tarot links with astrology, which links directly with human consciousness, because all contain the template, the schemata of the 3-4. Therefore, we cannot understand the tarot or astrology and their operations independently from an understanding of our mental dynamics. So when it is declared that the zodiac is within and that there is a living oracle inside each of us, it is said with total conviction based on the proofs given here. As stated, there is a definite three-four architecture innate to each of the divination arts. This structure exists and was encoded into the divination arts to make them analogs of the dynamics and operations of human consciousness. If they were not based on some plastic noetic template as consciousness, they would not yield the accurate information that they are known to do. Let us now see precisely how the three four divisions are encoded and function in regards to the zodiac and the tarot. There are actually three decks in one in the tarot. There's the major arcana of 22 cards, the minor arcana of 40 cards with the aces, and then there are the 16 court royal cards, or total 78. Then there are the four elements of fire, that's wands, or clubs in the regular deck, and there is water, that's cups or hearts in the regular deck. Then there is the element air or swords, which is spades in the regular deck. And then there is the element for earth, which is the discs or diamonds in the regular playing deck. Then in the round art of astrology, we also find these same four elements explicitly employed. In conjunction with these four, we also find the three modalities or triplicities called cardinal, fixed, and mutable. Astrologers are familiar with these three modalities, though they seldom employ them. But we understand now the reason why astrology and tarot have the numerical qualities they do is because their creators saw to it that they would embody the self-same harmonics and proportions that are innate to human consciousness and which, via psychic projection and inflation, are foisted onto the external creation also. The divination arts resonate with the mind of man and avail information about life because they are predicated upon the same archetypal fundamentals. Now, we can see why it is that the magician of the tarot stands at a strange table with three legs and a four-square top. From the very first card, we have a cryptic reference to the connection between the divination arts, that's the tools of the magician, and human consciousness. The card's number, let us remember, is one, which signifies the goal of the magician, which is to bring fourness to oneness. His esoteric letter, Baith, means house of God, which obviously refers to the pyramid whose sides are of three and whose base is of four. The pyramid is Egypt's table, and the magician is its builder. He builds not in granite and sandstone, however. He is the architect of an even greater temple, an inner one, a subtle one, just as precise and august as the one in granite which confounds science. The magician is the pharaoh. He is pharos nous the enlightened mind. So, in conclusion, we now understand how the tarot and astrology and the other divination arts are founded on the three-four template. This is because they are intimately connected with the nature of consciousness. The latter can therefore easily be analyzed by way of divination, as has been done for thousands of years. All the rankling and skepticism is completely without validity and is the product of little education as if the mind of man could distract itself for aeons and wasteful pursuits. It is the towering vanity of most modern intellectuals with their comfortably biased but desolate theories that have fostered the pernicious condescension 
towards these ancient arts. As we move into the new millennium, the human race has found remedial in its understanding of itself, of its own mental, emotional, and psychological workings. In 2,000 years, there is little trace of psychological improvement on the collective scale. Some have said that we've been culturally and spiritually in retrograde. The average individual remains as greedy, artificial, violent, and as immoral as ever, infatuated with the material and intoxicated with the fallacies of technology and science, or clinging to the hollow, exploitatory, orthodox religions to alleviate the inner void, the non-individual will undoubtedly remain a victim of his conditioning. The time has come for a return to the great mantic arts that our forefathers created for us. The divination arts are mirrors to our real selves. It is time to dust them off and look deeply into what they reveal. They are our means for finding ourselves again and for reawakening the magic of living. They enable us to master time so that we may master life. They bring us back to a higher state mentally, emotionally, and morally and allow us to wash the psyche of all of the pestilential debris which weighs us down and removes us from the natural innocence. They open wide the portals to communion with the higher self. They prepare the chambers of the self for the ultimate chemical wedding which awaits the men and women of virtue who sincerely seek the truth of themselves. You have now completed your Taroscopes tour. Also provided on this site are the comprehensive and updated meanings of the Tarot's major, minor, and court royal cards. Reversed meanings are also provided for increased accuracy and in readings. In the Taroscopic Mystery School, you will discover the complete method for working with the Tarot on many levels. You will also discover the means by which the four divination arts work together in perfect synergy. This is a mystery which has been lost and neglected for many an age. As we have just proven, the four great hermetic arts should never be considered, learned, taught, or practiced as separate disciplines. They are one mystery school curriculum. We now invite you to become a member of our online cyber college dedicated to the research and advancement of the hermetic arts of divination. By returning to the home page and clicking on the mystery school link, you will enter the membership area. If you click on the non-members link, you will read about the various entitlements that are free to full members of our online global metaphysical family. We also offer a full CD set of the Mystery School material entitled Tarot 2000, a Gnostic Approach for a New Millennium. As an alternative to online membership, you can view this set by clicking on the merchandise link and going to the Taroscope series page. Thanks for your time and interest.